Yes, I can say really. Yeah. Ah, so uh, awesome. Um, I'd just like to thank all the participants for joining this evening. 6 p.m. New Zealand, 4 p.m. Australia, that's the East Coast. And I guess that would make it 2 p.m. Perth, Malaysia time, and Indonesia, I think, would be about 2 or 1 p.m. And I'm sorry, all the people in South America. Um, I don't know what time zone you are, but it's got to be late in the evening. So thank you very much for joining. Um, we're looking forward to um, a great presentation tonight on vital pulp therapy. And um, we have a great speaker, um, Bakir, and he's just finished surgery, by the way. So worked all day. And thank you very much, Bakir, for uh, taking time this evening. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so um, I'll just uh, read your, your bi um, biography. Could be a, 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 it might take a while, so sorry about that. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Karabuchak is the Chair, Professor of Endodontics and Director of the Postdoctoral uh, Endodontics Program at UPenn. He's, an invo he's involved in endodontic courses and seminars and pre- and postdoctoral programs. He also runs selective microscope training courses for pre-doctoral students. After earning his degree, a dental degree from uh, Istanbul University School of Dental Medicine in 1993, Dr. Karabuchek completed his endodontic postgraduate training at the Department of Endodontics at uh, UPenn or Penn Dental Medicine in 1998, where he also received his master's in oral biology in 2002. He also earned his uh, DMD degree from Penn uh, Dental Medicine in 2002. His re research interests include cellular mechanisms of vasodilation, very relevant to today, and inflammatory mediators in dental pulp. Dr. Karabuchak has been attending endodontist, uh, sorry, Dr. Karabuchak has been the attending endodontist at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia since 2005 and is a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics. Additionally, he has lectured nationally and internationally in conferences and also serves as a reviewer for the Journal uh, of Endodontics. And I guess that's just a start, um, Bikir, because there's bound to be numerous other things you've done in your uh, prestigious life in endodontics. So um, without further ado, I will... Uh, Welcome you and uh, thank you and look forward to 45 minutes of presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will share my uh, screen here. Um, can you that's see it. my screen? Yeah, Perfect. that's excellent. Thank you very much. Perfect. Um, anyway, thank I'll, you. Be in the back, I'll be in the background, Kabir, so just scream if anything uh, starts to happen. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Steve, and, uh, thank you for the invitation. I wish I could... Um, be there uh, personally under different circumstances. However, the COVID uh, pandemic is affecting everybody. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, getting into that time period that we can travel again and uh, be all together. Um, yeah, yeah. But to, today, it's, uh, our topic is vital pop therapy. So I will uh, uh, talk about... Um, vital pop therapy and the materials that we use. And during the presentation, we will see different techniques of vital pop therapy, and we will discuss um, about the methodology, why and how we are doing vital pop therapy, and what's our philosophy here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but before we start, I want to share this um, interesting picture. Uh, we're, we're very proud of it. Um, this is the first class of graduate endodontic program uh, here at Penn, and this is class of 1947. So soon, next, I believe next year it will be, 75th year we will uh, celebrate. Um, there are a lot of history here uh, in our institution, especially in endodontics. Um, our classes, you know, if you look at this picture, the back uh, row, they're all male uh, students uh, with male professors. You know, today, 
a, a change like any school, dental school in the world. I believe the majority of students are female right now, uh, including our, ours. Uh, the three uh, gentlemen professors sitting in front, uh, I will highlight their picture here. Um, uh, these are the professors' grandfathers of uh, endodontics today. Uh, I was lucky to have uh, two of them as professors here when I was doing my studies. Uh, the first one is, if you see my cursor, um, this is Dr. Stewart. Dr. Stewart was the most quiet uh, among all. Uh, however, he was instrumental in establishing American Association of Endodontics here in the U.S. Uh, he wrote the bylaws of the association and he was a president, one of the first presidents of the association. Um, the gentleman in the middle, um, you recognize, you would recognize him. He doesn't need any introduction. That's Dr. Grossman. He's the one who wrote all the initial textbooks, uh, developed techniques and the uh, guidelines, principles for uh, endodontics today, uh, the, uh, what we um, practice. And the, uh, the, the professor gentleman on the right side, that's, that's I.B. Bender. If you uh, read classic endodontic journals, uh, I.B. Bender sets their articles, um, uh, that is uh, the classic. Uh, you know, I.B. Bender was uh, uh, instrumental in uh, laying the groundwork, uh, establishing the biological principles uh, in endodontics. And I.B. Bender actually published this article, uh, editorial article in 1980 in the Journal of Endodontics. Uh, the same article was published after he passed away early in 2000s. Um, but he, he argues in his uh, editorial um, that the, the future of endodontics uh, uh, as a specialist is very important. Um, is a specialty. Uh, also, uh, he talks about, which is still true to this day, uh, that we will always have these fast, simple techniques claiming that we can do our um, endodontic treatment much faster and it's going to simplify everything. Um, however, he says if we don't do research, if we don't understand bio biological uh, background information uh, principles, we cannot advance our, our um, specialty. Um, I always take this article as a, as a guide when I, I give lectures and I will be using, uh, we will be talking about basic science research and correlate that to clinical principles and the clinical technique. Um, so Throughout the presentation, we will see different vital pulp therapy techniques. These, this will be from stepwise excavation to direct indirect pulp capping, pulpotomies and svec pulpotomies. Uh, also, I will uh, spend some time on new materials that we have in endodontics. Um, start with MTA and mostly we will talk about endosequence root repair material um, and our, I'll share the research uh, results that we had in our department. Um, I believe it, it, endosequence root repair material is the same brand name that you have in uh, <clears throat> Australia, maybe New Zealand area. Um, in Asia, it could be total fill. Um, it's the same. Uh, I root is the same uh, brand, the same material, but it is... Um, sold under different names. Um, so let's go back to the principles of uh, endodontics, the goal of endodontics. The goal of endodontics, like any other branches of dentistry, is to maintain the oral health and the healthy function of, of our patients. Um, but endodontics in, in specifically, um, uh, our goal is to prevent and eliminate a disease process, disease called apical periodontitis. Um, uh, for that, we usually do root canal, we access 
the roots to the apex, disinfect the root canal system, seal the root canal system. Um, and we're very successful uh, uh, in doing uh, root canal treatments. And our outcome is really promising. Um, however, um, a part of our endodontics is to, pre to prevention, prevent the apical disease process. So we do protect healthy pulp and seal the tooth structure so we can eliminate any inflammation, infection that may occur within the root system as well. Um, so uh, this uh, article, Kakashi's article, uh, published in 1965, most of you are, uh, I believe, familiar with this article. Um, this is one of the classic articles that we all learn in dental school, in endodontic school. Uh, also, I believe this is the most cited article in endodontics and in dentistry. Um, what Kakahashi showed in his article um, uh, that the importance of bacteria in our disease process. He correlated the presence or absence of uh, microorganisms uh, to um, necrotic pulp and the disease process. In his article, in his uh, research project, he used conventional uh, rats and germ-free rats. In conventional rat, all the specimens that he created pulp exposure uh, showed pulp necrosis disease uh, periapical tissues eight days after the exposure. Um, so we always uh, talk about this research, this article, and we, we emphasize the presence and absence of microbial flora uh, in in necrotic cases. However, I would like to emphasize another secondary outcome of this, this study, which we don't talk about it too much, was in uh, germ-free animals. In the absence of microorganisms, the pulp had great potential to protect itself and heal itself. In 14 days, he showed that dentinal bridge was forming protecting the pulp and isolating the pulp tissue from the exposed area. Um, further studies in, in late 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, showed that actually uh, when we have cavitation in enamel, isolated strictly in the enamel area, the bacteria can get into dentinal tubules, can travel to the pulpal tissue through dentinal tubules, um, and can cause inflammatory reaction uh, at the cavitation site. Uh, you see the differentiation of odontoblastic layer, changes in odontoblastic layer. So even if even we have a cavity, cavitation in enamel, we see reaction in the pulp um, in these specimens. Dr. Bergenholz in 80s uh, showed the same reaction in human teeth. Uh, but what he showed that when we remove the caries, when we remove the irritant and we seal the cavity and we see the reparative dentin sealing the open dentinal tubules and protecting the pulp tissue. And he concluded his studies showing that the pulp has high capacity to, to heal and repair itself with uh, reparative dentin. However, when the caries lesion advances into dentinal, uh, into deeper layers of dentin, it's, or when the ca caries exposes the pulp, histological studies show that the inflammatory uh, reaction is more intense and advanced in the, the pulp tissue. And even uh, histological sections show the necrotic parts within that area. Um, so, but histological studies also show that when you look at the dental pulp away from the inflammatory zone, it's, it's you, you face with healthy pulp. 
you face with the, the pulp that it's in reversible stage, that it can protect itself, can repair itself. Um, so this is very, very interesting uh, finding in pulp biology as well. If you read Dr. Kim's pulp biology articles, uh, he talks about um, pulpal tissue really preventing the inflammatory process advancing very quickly to the apical portion and it, it advances layer by layer. Always you find reversible pulp, healthy pulp, right under heavily inflamed and necrotic pulp tissue. That's why in um, 80s, early 90s, when we did or when um, the pulp capping was proposed, uh, the outcome was very, very uh, um, uh, unfavorable, really unfavorable. The success Bertel in 2000s show uh, five years later, uh, success of pulp capping was 37 uh, percent. So as a result, because we cannot differentiate or we cannot um, identify where the inflammatory process ends, where the reversible process start, um, the pulp capping uh, procedure in carious exposure cases was not recommended. And, and the root canal treatment was recommended uh, in those cases. Um, and as we all agree that reversible or irreversible pulpitis cases give us the best success rate, uh, when we do root canal treatment on those cases, we can easily um, reach 90% above success. So if you ask me which one you prefer, 90 plus percent success rate, or with the pulp capping 37% success, I, I would you know, agree with everybody that we would go with higher success and root canal treatment. Um, however, if you look at the new um, and other histological studies, uh, caries exposure teeth uh, that we deem ir as irreversible pulpitis, uh, they have really heavy bacterial colonization at the coronal section uh, where the exposure is with high concentration of uh, uh, inflammatory mediators. Um, but when you go to the apical section, when you look at histologically to the root end, uh, you see that less severe reaction with uninflamed pulp tissue with normal architecture. And histologically, diagnosis would be reversible pulpitis, and there's no necrosis, there's no really bacterial infection. So this has been always a dilemma in endodontics, especially the new modern thinking with um, advancement in pulpal regeneration. We always talk about why we are taking the whole pulp out when we do root canal treatment, knowing that part of this pulp can survive if we can treat this pulp. Um, uh, Dr. Lindy, one of our um, uh, deans in dental school here, he was an endodontist, he was a periodontist. Uh, he used to say the best uh, root canal filling material is the pulp, healthy pulp tissue, its own tissue. So if you think about that one, the new thinking is that, yes, great, why extirpating the whole pulp, we reach high success rates, but histologically, we know that we are taking uh, out uh, not only the disease portion of the tooth, but majority of the time, healthy par uh, part of the pulp. So um, uh, beyond all in 90s, um, it suggested to use the healing potential of the pulp and the antibacterial properties of the material to our advantage. And he uh, proposed this uh, vital pulp therapy uh, called stepwise excavation. So uh, we know that when the pulp is exposed, when we have the carious exposure, our success rate goes down to 37%. So what he was proposing that in 
in reversible cases, these are all permanent teeth with deep caries. They were positive to uh, vitality testing without lingering. So they were really giving the signs of uh, irreversible, not irreversible, reversible pulpitis. Uh, what he was doing, he was excavating the caries uh, in the peripheral area, you will see it there. Um, uh, he would remove completely the necrotic and demineralized dentin, uh, but where the, the middle portion, where the soft, wet, or discolored dentin, central, right sitting on the uh, pulpal area, he would leave intentionally that area uh, without touching. So his whole purpose was, I'm going to reduce the irritant from the tooth, but I'm okay with leaving a little bit of soft dentin, infected dentin in that area just to prevent pulp exposures. And I'm going to give pulp a chance to protect itself and reverse the inflammatory process. For this, uh, these cases, it is important, I have to emphasize, I, I will keep emphasizing that the permanent uh, teeth with deep carious lesions, uh, pulp responded to vitality testing within normal limits. There was no lingering to the cold. There was no history of spontaneous pain. This is an important finding because I.B. Bender in his articles, classic articles, show that uh, history of spontaneous pain, unprovoked pain, really indicates the irreversible pulpitis stage. And the patients, they had no pain with the percussion. So he was placing calcium hydroxide, uh, known to be really effective antibacterial agent, over the soft dentin. He was closing these, sealing these cavities with glass ionomer, and he was opening four to eight months after the first procedure. So what he observed uh, that this soft, uh, discolored dentin, wet dentin, with the help of antibacterial um, material, uh, also with the help of pulp, reparative potential of the pulp, uh, was becoming harder, much darker, and it's, it's not, not infected dentin anymore. So he, if it was needed, he was going back in, he was creating out a little bit more soft tissue or soft dentin, and he was placing calcium hydroxide back and wait another four to eight months. Um, and as a result, his study showed 86% success, uh, these cases. And he had less pulp exposures. I think um, fewer pulp exposures uh, was seen as more successful cases. Um, I believe 86% success is a very good success. And, uh, and he concluded that in the absence of the microbial flora, uh, the, the pulp can regenerate or reform uh, dentin bridge and protect itself. So the, the problem with these, uh, these studies also was the material. Um, so in those studies from 90s and 2000s or 80s, uh, most of the time the materials they used was calcium hydroxide, zinc oxide, eugenol, IRM, dical, or the first generations of composites. Um, the, the problem with these materials were they did not seal really, really well. Uh, they did not have uh, healing potential. Calcium hydroxide, yes, killed bacteria, but did not have any uh, healing potential, did not induce the odontoblastic cells to reproduce more dentin bridge or the uh, um, secondary dentin. Uh, all those materials, they were porous. Um, and they did not uh, attach to the dentin the way we understand today how the composites, they, they bind to the dentin. Um, in, uh, with time, with function, they cause leakage. 
leakage meant new bacteria introduced into that area. Also, the other problem was ongoing canal calcification. When I was in the program studying, uh, you know, my endo and the Donix in late 90s, my older professors about pop capping or vital pop therapy would say, yeah, but what are you going to do? This canal will continue calcifying. In 10 years, 15 years, this patient will come back to you and it's going to be very difficult to find those calcified canals. Um, therefore, they did not recommend vital pop therapy. Whenever we had deep caries, whenever we had pop exposures, uh, we all did extirpate the whole pulp and did the root canal treatment. New, back, new uh, biomaterial, uh, bioactive materials. We have very exciting materials now in the, uh, the market. These are uh, MTAs or the endosequence bioceramic. Um, in general, they prevent micro leakage much, much better than the other materials. It, they have antibacterial, um, uh, anti-infection properties. Uh, they attach to the dentin. This is not really chemical bonding, but this is more of a mechanical bonding that improves the, um, uh, the uh, adhesion more and more with time that we, I'm going to share a couple of slides with you later that we're going to discuss. Um, and it, these new materials, they allow uh, healthy dentinal barrier formation below the, the material. So uh, these materials, they have dual outcome. If we need to summarize, it's, uh, they improve the coronal seal of restorations. Also, uh, it optimizes the development of a heart tissue barrier, which is the goal uh, of vital pulp therapy. In, uh, let's talk about the materials a little bit, uh, mainly bioceramics. A um, few years ago, I'm talking about maybe 10 years ago, um, uh, MTA was very successful, uh, very popular. Everybody was using MTA. At uh, that time, I was a junior faculty, and Dr. Kim was my program director and the chair. He came to me and he said, uh, Bikir, I... I received this new MTA-like material. He said, I'm, I'm very happy with my MTA. I'm not interested in this material. Um, so that material stayed, I think, on my desk for a month or two. Then with my colleagues, we said, why don't we try experiment with this material? And that material turned out to be uh, endosequence bioceramic material. Uh, so the bioceramic materials are not new. Um, they actually um, uh, was introduced after the Vietnam War. Um, the U.S. military was trying to help the soldiers wounded and coming back from Vietnam War. Um, the prosthesis that they were getting, they were not really um, working well, uh, maybe for a couple of years, and the body was rejecting those prosthesis um, uh, limbs or anything uh, placed in the body. That time, the researchers came up with a new material called bioglass, and the paradigm shift that time. The paradigm shift from bioresorbable, bioinert towards the bioactive materials. Um, actually, as dentists, we understand this much better than the other professionals because we place implants. And when we place implants in the bone, we want this implant to osteointegrate, bone to grow around it, and the implant to become one piece with the, uh, with the bone structure. So exactly the same thing. The bioactive materials they form a surface, um, on their surface, a layer of appetite-like material. And that uh, appetite-like material is, uh, allows the soft tissue or hard tissue, like, like bone, to attach the, to the 
prosthesis or this bioactive material. In dentistry or in medicine, we mostly use bioglass. However, the bioglass has a specific formula and, uh, and it has a specific use that FDA and the commercial uh, companies accepted. In dentistry, we translated that bioglass name to bioceramics. So today we don't call them bioglass, we call them bioceramics. And in, in dentistry, unlike the medicine, the main components of bioceramics are calcium oxide, silicon dioxide, and calcium eliminate. If you change one of the other, if you add more calcium oxide or more calcium eliminate, you change the characteristics of the material. Um, so most of the uh, calcium eliminate based materials, these are our restorative materials where we use uh, them to cement our crowns, glass ionomer, uh, cements are all calcium eliminate base. And as you know, the, the material acts differently than other materials that we use in endodontics. In endodontics, we use mostly calcium silicate base some, uh, materials. Um, um, what are they? Uh, calcium silicate uh, cements could be Portland based cements could be tricalcium silicate uh, base cements. Um, we call them hydraulic uh, calcium silicate cements because these materials, they set in the presence of moisture. That's why we call them hydraulic. So what are the Portland cement base material that we use or what is it or what is the calcium silicate cement that we use in endodontics? Uh, try MTA. MTA is uh, the first generation uh, material that we use. Actually, this is mostly um, Portland-based material. It, it was introduced, I believe I was in the program in late 90s. Um, Dr. Trubinich had introduced this material into endodontics. Uh, we all receive samples to, to use in surgical endodontics. Um, this material over the years uh, became very popular and we start to use in vital pulp therapy, surgeries, perforation repair, and in a lot of aspects of endodontics. Um, this was a super material. Um, it was uh, biocompatible. Uh, even our own studies of MTA show that the tissue can grow over. Uh, the sealing ability was very, very good. I believe that's why this material was uh, very successful compared to other endodontic materials because it sealed really well. Antibacterial properties and the new heart tissue formed right over the material, which we never saw on super EBA or IRM type of materials. Um, studies, this is Bogan's study, um, uh, used this MTA on direct pulp capping, showed very, very, very good response. Uh, what Bogan did, going back to our vital pulp therapy topic, Bogan took uh, close to, um, I think 53, close to 55 maybe teeth, um, and he followed them uh, from one year to seven years. Uh, he selected these cases. They were all permanent teeth with deep caries. Uh, they were positive to pulp testing without lingering, meaning that they were vital. But when you apply cold, patient felt the cold, but not really lingering. No history of spontaneous pain, no provoked pain. And there was no uh, apical lesion uh, present on the, on the x-ray. So... He had pulp exposures and he did vital pulp therapy with MTA. Why this was very interesting study because this was one of the first um, study trying MTA in pulp capping and changing that the vital pulp therapy with MTA could be very successful unlike the studies that we saw at the beginning of the pr presentation, 37%. 
Bogan showed that overall success is somewhere 97, 98%. Five years later, the success of maintaining healthy pulp structure and um, was 94%. This is a very, very good result showing the success of bioceramic materials in endodontics. This is one of my cases uh, uh, showing a SVEC pulpotomy. SVEC pulpotomies we do after uh, trauma cases. When the patient breaks an anterior tooth, fractures the tooth, uh, when the pulp is exposed, Svek suggested that we can remove two, three millimeters of the pulp uh, into the pulp chamber and we can seal the root canal system with um, calcium hydroxide. That was Svek's uh, suggestion. And he showed successful treatments um, uh, over the years. He published many articles uh, showing that the Svek pulpotomy, taking a part of the, 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 the nerve tissue, sealing it, um, uh, uh, protects the tooth, and uh, the tooth continues developing, uh, and um, uh, especially young teeth. So this case is one of my cases. Uh, many years ago, this patient came in um, uh, after trauma, uh, upper uh, central incisor was fractured, um, exposing the pulp. Uh, within 48 hours, patient came to our clinic and patient had no pain other than just pain to soft tissue because of the trauma. Um, cold test revealed mild sensitivity, no lingering, no spontaneous pain. Patient within two days had no unprovoked pain. Um, when we did the percussion, percussion was a little bit um, sensitive, but this is understandable because of the trauma. The tissue surrounding the tooth was traumatized. Um, so we decided to do Svek pulpotomy. We removed two, three millimeters of the pulp with sharp diamond burr. We stopped bleeding and we placed MTA right on top of the soft tissue, uh, pulp tissue. And we closed with um, temporary filling material and we wanted to see the patient a week or 10 days later to make sure everything was going well. This is a year and a half later. You can see uh, really well the dentinal bridge formation right underneath the MTA seal. The more important thing, the root development continued. Uh, initially, when the trauma happened, you see the apical portion is exposed, open, large, and the one and a half year follow-up, uh, the root closed um, and showing the expected development of the root tip. But let's look at this intraoral picture. Um, you see this color change. This was one of the problems with the MTA that it's stained teeth. Um, um, it's, you know, if this was my teenager daughter, I wouldn't like to have her stained tooth after trauma treatment. Um, uh, this, this kid did not care. He was really um, active basketball player. Um, however, you know, you don't want to have this uh, staining uh, in an aesthetic zone. Um, if you look at the studies, uh, for the uh, drag pop capping in the literature, um, uh, this meta-analysis uh, combination of all the studies published in literature showed a very high success rate in, um, in uh, vital pulp therapy, actually much higher than calcium hydroxide um, uh, vital pulp therapies. Um, however, the MTA had had issues. Uh, MTA had a very poor handling properties. It's like sand. You mix it, um, it is very difficult to carry into the cavity. If you were doing surgical procedure, it was very difficult to, to bring into root end preparation. In vital cases especially, um, it, it was um, 
not not pliable. Um, it was difficult to condense. It took very long time to set. The, it it takes four hours to set in the presence of moisture, and I think the one of the uh, biggest disadvantages was the discoloration of the tooth. In any, any case, any vital pulp therapy you uh, do on on uh, anterior aesthetic zone would have issues with discoloration. So uh, we come to the uh, tri the other tricalcium silicate based cement. This is the next generation uh, repair materials. Uh, this is the bioceramic material. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the talk, that this is marketed in the United States, I believe in, in Australia, New Zealand, maybe as endo sequence root repair material. Um, the rest of the, uh, the word could be iRoot uh, or in Europe is, uh, is marketed under different name. Um, but they are all same material, just the marketing name is different. So what's uh, good about this bioceramic uh, material? Um, the uh, tricalcium silicate based cements, they set in the presence of moisture. When the material um, mixed with moisture, it, it gets into setting reaction. As a result, calcium hydroxide is released and the calcium hydroxide gets back into the reaction until, um, it, as a result, the, the hydroxide epitite layer appears and the water released. This calcium hydroxide ions and the water, this reaction continues until the calcium ion concentration is in balance and it may take um, days uh, for this reaction to to complete. Um, uh, this is not a setting reaction. Please don't mix it up. This is just the maturing material. So why this is an advantage for us? Because that this material uh, requires moisture to set. In endodontics or in dentistry, moisture is something that we prevent. When we do amalgams, when we do uh, composites, historically amalgams, when we do composite um, uh, fillings, we try to eliminate the moisture as much as we can, or we try to prevent moisture coming into our cavities. Um, in the root canal system, we cannot control the moisture. It's always moist. So it, it takes advantage of the moisture within the dentin, uh, this material, uh, when the presence of water moisture, it sets and it creates this layer that we typically see in bioceramic, bioactive materials, hydroxyapatite layer. Where this moisture is coming from, as I said, it's coming from the dentin uh, that initiates the, the formation of hydroxyapatite layer and the, um, it improves the material over time. So as I said, this calcium hydro the, uh, hydroxyapatite layer appears um, it, on top of the material. So this is a very friendly material or element or the, uh, however you call it, the particles for the soft tissue to attach on. Uh, also, I believe uh, that's why the MTA type of material was so successful in sealing the, the, the cavities because this hydroxyapatite layer with time continues sealing the cavity walls um, and preventing the bacteria coming back into the pulpal area, pulp tissue. Um, on the material, when you wait 60 days under the SCM, you see these small particles. And in some studies, especially uh, coming out of Japan, they define these particles as calcium um, or the hydroxyapatite layer um, uh, that it's typical, that it's in between sealer and the dentin or on top of the putty material in 60 days in the, mo in the presence of moisture, you see these, these um, small particles um, 
uh, appearing. So why it is important, these particles? Um, uh, as I said, the uh, maturity, the material takes uh, days to mature, uh, this, the material, and in, with the maturity, with the development of these particles, it seals, closes the, the gaps between the material and the dentin. Also, these particles, they go into dentinal tubules and it locks in the material. If you remember at the beginning of the talk, I said these materials, they have great binding or uh, properties, but it is not chemical. It is more physical binding. It is these particles attaching to the material at the same time gets into dentinal tubules and it locks the material in, seals the, the cavity much, much better. So the other the, um, property is the release of calcium hydroxide. As you know, we use calcium hydroxide as intracanal medicament or uh, in older days, we use this for um, uh, stepwise excavation or pulp capping. Um, calcium hydroxide is known to have very high pH. As a result, it is a very good antibacterial um, material. So during the setting reaction of bioceramics, calcium hydroxide is released. That re increases the pH of the material. So a couple of years ago, we wanted to see how this material and the increased pH affects the biofilm. Um, we took a bunch of dentinal discs, we grew biofilm over, and we placed bioceramic material on top of the biofilm. If you look at these images, the green uh, shows all alive bacteria. This is really um, healthy biofilm on dentinal uh, discs. And this is two weeks after, I think you should look at this image, two weeks after bioceramic is enough to kill most of the bacteria um, within uh, the biofilm structure. And also, if you look at the dentinal tubules, the red is all dead bacteria into dentinal tubules. This antibacterial effect of the material not uh, stays only on the surface, but also affects the dentinal tubules. If there is any bacterial growth in the dentinal tubules, it, it kills the bacteria within the dentinal tubules as well. So uh, you may tell me, you may ask, like, the cure, how can you explain if this bio, uh, this um, uh, material has very high pH, but at the same time, this material is uh, really friendly to biological tissues. You know, high pH usually kill the cells. Uh, however, um, the studies, this is one of our studies done in the, in the our lab, shows great properties of this material when you put the cells on. Um, this, I believe, comes um, from the bioactive part of this material. This material releases calcium ions um, with time, and the calcium ions, they're known to induce cell differentiation. Uh, I believe that overcomes the pH, high pH effect of this material. So if you look at these images, uh, RRM is the root repair material, our endosequence uh, bioceramic material. This is human bone uh, marrow stem cells. You see the cells attaching each other, and you see the PDL uh, stem cells. They are all connected, and this is dental pulps, um, uh, papilla stem cells. They are all connected to each other. So I always tell... Um, when I talk about these topics, that these cells, they are like humans. Uh, when the weather is nice, we're happy. We like to go out and connect to each other, connect uh, and talk to each other and um, socialize. Uh, when we're not happy, we go home, we want to be alone. The cells are the same. When they are happy on a material like this, they socialize and they connect. Um, they touch to each other. That's how we know that these are very healthy uh, stem cells differentiating on top of the uh, bioceramic material. 
Also, uh, uh, many years ago, we uh, conducted this animal research where we did a lot of root end surgeries um, and we used root repair material and we looked at histologically the response of periapical tissues to this material. Um, if you uh, see my cursor, you see RRM, this is root repair material, and you see the hard tissue barrier, cementum-like tissue growing over the material. And this shows that this material is really friendly, uh, induces hard tissue formation. This could be cementum when you use it uh, for surgical procedures or in the vital pulp therapy cases that is cementum dentin-like hard tissue formation. Um, so as a conclusion, a take home message, um, the root repair material, bioceramic material that we use today um, is well tolerated by vital tissue. It's antimicrobial. Uh, it is uh, stable um, the dimensionally. It's it, unlike composites, you know, composites, they, we know that they have shrinkage when they set. Um, but this material, it's not only stable uh, with time, with maturity, actually, it locks itself into dentinal tubules much better. It's much easier to manipulate compared to other materials or specifically MTA. Um, doesn't change the color. Um, we have conducted a couple of studies in terms of discoloration of this material um, and discoloration of the teeth after vital pulp therapy. Um, root repair material is uh, one of the safest materials to use in the aesthetic zone um, as long as you control bleeding. If you have a lot of bleeding coming in, obviously this material will soak in the the blood um, and everything will be discolored. But if you can control bleeding and if you put material on top of um, a well um, established hemostasis, uh, it should not discolor teeth. And also, it has uh, dentinogenic properties that induces heart tissue barrier formation uh, right on the material. So, Let's go back to our topic. As I said, I will talk about different, uh, I'll go to different directions and, and we will come back to vital pop therapy over and over again. Um, let's look at some cases um, and let's discuss how we select our cases when we do vital pop therapy, what's important in our diagnosis process and how we follow these cases. So this is a uh, example of an indirect pulp capping um, case. Um, there is no pulp exposure. The cavity is really isolated within the enamel and dentin. Uh, this case was a permanent tooth with deep caries. Um, so we select obviously permanent teeth with deep caries. It is extremely important to do all your vitality testing. This is called EPT if you need to, percussion, palpation, and you have to get a good history from a patient. Uh, the tooth should be vital, first of all, and it should respond with the normal limits to vitality test without lingering. When you talk about lingering, then we talk about the inflammatory process being more advanced in the pulp tissues. That's why we select... Um, our cases um, uh, according to the cold test and the lingering results. And the other important thing, there shouldn't be uh, any history of spontaneous pain. Uh, patients should say, no, I don't have any pain waking me up in the middle of the night. I don't have any pain when I don't chew or eat, um, or if I don't have any pain when I drink cold. Um, so we remove the caries completely um, until we come to solid dentin tooth structure. Um, this case uh, uh, was one of our graduate students' case that you see on the x-ray, lower second molar. 
it's almost uh, radiographic. It looks like carious exposure, um, young tooth, open apices, and under the microscope, the decay looked like that. Um, it, you should always expect that the pulp may be exposed during the procedure. That's why we need to uh, work aseptically. We should take all the precautions to make sure um, we're not going to introduce bacteria into the cavity. Uh, that means if you need to use a rubber dam or my suggestion to use rubber dam all the time in these cases, that's a very effective way of eliminating or keeping the saliva bacteria away from the area. The other one, using some sort of a microscope or magnification. Um, I have, uh, I, as an endodontist, I always use microscope, uh, obviously. Uh, I always find additional details that I need to look, I need to explore. Um, I can differentiate healthy dentin uh, from infected or, or affected dentin under the microscope. Um, uh, this was after removing initial bulk of the, uh, the dentin. Um, there are a little bit of uh, red spots concerning if there was a pulp exposure. So, but we have to re remove the rest of the soft dentin. And slowly with slow speed or excavators, we can, whichever you um, feel comfortable, I always use uh, initially slow speed, um, clean the peripheral and slowly touching the areas surfacing the pulp chamber. And I, and when I don't feel comfortable anymore, I switch to sharp spoon excavator and I clean with spoon excavator and clean with alcohol in between. And in this case, we were able to reach hard dentin without, without exposing the pulp. And this is indirect Pulp capping, as studies show that the, we should have way above 90% success rates. And we prepared and we covered uh, the area with root repair material. Uh, I use thick root repair material covering all the surfaces because I know this material seals really well with time especially, and it has biological effects. If there's any dentinal tubules open, this is going to affect the pulp closer to that area. On top of it, we use um, Fuji glass ionomer just to seal uh, the uh, root repair material. Um, if uh, you, know, you remember the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about glass ionomer cements being in the same family of bioglass, uh, the GI cements should uh, attach to root repair material much, much better than any other material. And we cover it with either another glass ionomer or sometimes I just do my composite filling on top. Why I do my composite filling? Because at this point, I know it's clean. If I need to open up, I just need to take the composite out. My goal is to seal my root repair material, my dentin, exposed dentin completely, and I don't want any leakage happening when I seal it. So this is the x-ray. Uh, the x-ray shows very close proximity of the material to the pulp, but clinically we know there was no pulp exposure and we should expect 90 plus percent success rate with these cases as beyond all in his research showed. Um, but again, I wanna emphasize the diagnosis and symptoms, very important to identify. These are all permanent uh, teeth with deep caries, no pulp exposure, positive to pulp testing without lingering and no history of spontaneous pain. Um, let's look at the, to another uh, case, uh, direct pulp capping. Uh, direct pulp capping is done when you have, uh, you expose the pulp. This could be very little carious exposure, uh, but uh, very little, not too much of uh, carious exposure. Or this could be 
during your cleaning, uh, you expose the pulp with your burr or with your excavator. Um, again, it is very important to establish the, the, your diagnosis and symptoms before doing this procedure. These are all permanent uh, teeth with deep caries. They test positive to uh, vitality testing without lingering, no spontaneous pain, um, no radiographic apical periodontitis. Uh, young patients, even though most of the studies included wide range of patients with different ages uh, from you know, eight, nine years old to 70 years old. And those studies, they showed that um, younger patients, the, they respond much better than older patients um, because they have much better, obviously, healing potential. Uh, when you have direct pulp capping, uh, when you expose the pulp, the other indicator is the bleeding control. Most of the studies showing high success rate, they were able to control bleeding within 5 to 10 minutes. If bleeding continues more than 10 minutes, then we cannot just do direct pulp capping. We need to go to one step further to pulpotomies. And the exposure size, uh, the studies shows that, show that any, any exposure less than five millimeter would give better prognosis. If you have larger than five millimeter, then we need to, we may need to go a little bit deeper, take away a small piece of um, assumed inflamed pulp, part of the pulp and uh, seal it uh, with our root repair material. Um, this is a case for, uh, for uh, direct pulp capping. This deep caries lesion was removed under uh, rubber dam and under microscope. Uh, even though we were very careful, couple small excavation um, movement exposed the pulp. And you will see bleeding coming up and you have to stop bleeding. How we stop bleeding, I have a couple other uh, cases later to show but uh, you take a small cotton pellet, you soak uh, with sodium hypochlorite. This is what we use. Um, uh, sodium hypochlorite is very uh, effective antibacterial agent. So I always wipe my cavities in direct, indirect, um, or um, partial pulpotomy, pulpotomy cases uh, with sodium hypochlorite because my goal is to work aseptically, reduce the bacterial load as much as I can. So uh, we place a cotton pellet soaked with sodium hypochlorite. We put pressure on the exposed area for five minutes to 10 minutes, and then we check. If we establish hemostasis, and uh, that's a great candidate to do the uh, direct pop capping. So as you see on this, X, on this image, we covered all the exposed area with RRM. Um, uh, technically, I would I would remove a little bit of RRM covering the margin, so I you know you can get a better adaptation of your your composite uh, or glass ionomer. And uh, the the tooth was restored with glass ionomer cement in this situation. And this is one week later. Uh, it is important to contact the patient a week and two weeks later to make sure they don't develop spontaneous pain. This is six months later, and this is two years after the initial treatment. Uh, you appreciate that the dentinal bridge formation under um, the bioceramic material. Uh, that shows us that we were able to maintain the healthy tooth structure healthy pulp structure, and that had great potential to heal, block itself with reparative dentin. And uh, now it is time to go back and restore this tooth permanently if, you, you know, if, if it wasn't done uh, already. Um, so this video sh is an example how we do this. Again, under the microscope, this was a drink pulp capping um, I'm going to play one more time uh, this video. Um, um, 
with the clean excavator, we, we make sure we have hard dentin. And this is the cotton pellet soaked with sodium hypochlorite. We just dab and put pressure on the exposed area. So what's the concentration of sodium hypochlorite we use? We routinely use 3% in our clinic. Uh, that is considered half strength in the United States. If you use 1% sodium hypochlorite, that's fine. If you, you are using full strength 6%, that is fine. Uh, as long as it is soaked, not really runny, um, and you put pressure on the teeth. Um, and this is the x-ray uh, of the same case. So after we establish the hemostasis, this is the bioceramic. You see the uh, well-controlled bleeding and a small piece of bioceramic putty was placed over exposed dentin and exposed uh, pulp. Um, and uh, uh, we placed um, maybe a millimeter, two millimeter thick uh, putty. Uh, we make sure it sets. Uh, this is a fast set putty that's supposed to set within 10-15 minutes according to studies. We put moist cotton pellet on top another five minutes until it initiate or starts setting uh, so we can um, place our glass ionomer on top of it. In this case I would place a glass ionomer completely seal everything um, uh, and observe this case. So direct pulp capping, again, I wish I could share um, studies, outcome studies with uh, the new bioceramic material. Uh, however, the classic articles are all on MTA or biodentin. Um, uh, we are, as an institution, working on uh, studies as well, uh, following our cases. Um, but these studies, they showed that direct pulp capping uh, in young cases, young patients with MTA has success uh, close to 95%. This was um, close to two-year follow-up. And also this article was published in 2017. This was one-year follow-up on uh, MTA and biodentin cases. And this was uh, somewhere 95%. So um, the direct pulp capping with biologically friendly materials, uh, this, the, it's very successful. It's not like the old concepts that it will never work. Uh, these new materials, they seal much, much better and they induce dentin formation on healthy pulp. How about pulpotomies? When we do pulpotomies, uh, this could be full pulpotomy, this could be partial pulpotomy. Um, the diagnosis is uh, it's the same. Uh, we work on, we do these procedures on permanent teeth with deep caries. Um, it is extremely important to, to do all the tests, cold, percussion, palpation, EPT if it's necessary. And these cases, they all respond um, these vitality testing uh, within normal limits without lingering. No spontaneous pain. Uh, there's um, absence of uh, apical periodontitis on the x-rays. You may see a little bit of um, dark spots around the apices that you may question if this is apical periodontitis. This is normal appearance with these deep cavity cases. It may happen. And uh, young patients, they respond well. Um, we need to have bleeding control less than one, uh, 10 minutes. Um, to differentiate the previously, I said five to 10 minutes, this is 10 minutes. If you cannot control uh, within five to 10 minutes uh, it, it, for direct pop capping cases, then the next step would be pulpotomies. When you go back in deeper, remove a little bit uh, pulp tissue, uh, assuming inflamed pulp tissue, uh, we should be able to establish hemostasis within 10 minutes. And the exposure si size, more than 5 millimeter. Whenever we have exposure size uh, more than 5 millimeters, instead of direct pulp capping, we consider pulpotomy, and meaning that we take away um, the top layer of the pulp tissue. So this case, um, 
but pulp exposure was very large and the we couldn't stop the bleeding within five minutes we decided to do full pulpotomy in this case uh, so with um, we removed the the pulp tissue from the pulp chamber uh, all the way to the orifices and then we placed um, two some places three millimeter thick uh, by a ceramic material and we sealed with um, glass ionomer or as I said, if you have composite build-up materials, I prefer to use build-up material because the success really depends how well we seal these cavities and we need to seal these cavities really well. Um, let's look at this case. This was a, a popotomy case from our clinic, one of our residents. Uh, if we did all the diagnostic tests uh, and we decided to try vital pulp therapy. Why we decided to do vital pulp therapy? Deep carious, a uh, very young tooth. You still see the apices open, not mature. Patient did not have any lingering pain. And more importantly, patient did not report any spontaneous pain. Um, we did the full pulpotomy on this case. And we followed, this is 18 months later, you see really nice dentinal bridge formation uh, under the um, the material, and also uh, you see the the continuation of the root development. So um, this is this shows that we maintain the vitality of the tooth. This shows that we allow this tooth to grow and mature. Um, if you are uh, concerned that this canal is calcifying a little more than usual. It's too thin. It will be more difficult to find the, uh, the canals if you need to root canal treatment. Um, you may choose to do root canal treatment at this point. And, you know, it would be still a successful case because we achieve what we wanted to achieve. We um, manage uh, to induce the root uh, development. So now the root canal treatment would be much, much easier uh, to do. Uh, this is, uh, these are the intraoral um, uh, pictures of that case where we had very large exposure, not in one spot, but we had multiple spots. Uh, as I said, uh, more than five millimeter exposures. Uh, we waited uh, to establish hemostasis, but it was bleeding uh, more than uh, normal. Uh, we couldn't establish hemostasis with sodium hypochlorite soaked cotton pellets and pressure. And we decided to go into deeper layers. We completely unroofed. We removed the, the pulpal tissue. Here you see um, uh, that we reached the floor of the chamber. With the round burr, this is diamond burr because you need more cleaner cuts on the, the uh, pulp tissue. We went into orifices just to make sure we removed a um, good amount of uh, pulp tissue around the pulp, uh, the, the orifices. Um, and we uh, tried to stop bleeding one more time with our soaked cotton pellet. At this moment, we were um, able to establish good hemostasis uh, on the pulpal tissue and um, this is a bioceramic uh, material, root repair material, endosequence. Um, endosequence root repair material comes in a couple different formats, um, putty, uh, fast set, and we used to have, I'm not sure if it's still available, we used to have um, a, the flowable one. Um, this is flowable one that we injected, laid a couple small layer over the orifices. The purpose of this is to prevent pushing the material into deeper layers. So we lay a little bit of a um, layer of bioceramic material and we cover the top with the putty. Um, it, I think the material may benefit if we soaked with uh, or we apply you know, saline soaked or water, sterile water soaked cotton pellet, just wait a couple of minutes 
uh, to make sure the material uh, starts setting. And now we cover with putty root repair material. If you don't have flowable uh, root repair material, if you are using bioceramic sealer, you can use bioceramic sealer in the same, uh, with the same technique in the same manner. Um, you can deposit just a sealer over orifices just to create a little bit of a layer of bioceramic and then you can add bioceramic putty two, three millimeters uh, thick and we you know, put cotton pellet again, moist cotton pellet and in this case, this sheet was sealed with um, temporary filling material to follow up and, uh, and uh, bring the patient back. So this is uh, one more case. The pulpotomy was done. This is a partial pulpotomy from one of our residents, Mohammed. Um, uh, he exposed the um, the pulp tissue. We couldn't establish the hemostasis, even though it was a small exposure, less than five millimeter. We couldn't really stop bleeding, and we decided to go in with diamond burr. Instead of taking the whole pulp tissue all the way to the orifices, we just wanted to remove the inflamed tissue until we establish the hemostasis. So step by step, we went in with the bird, removed a, a layer of pulp tissue. We applied uh, pressure. We couldn't stop bleeding. We went back in. We removed a little bit more uh, uh, pulp tissue. And at this level, we were able to establish hemostasis and we uh, applied or sealed this whole chamber with bioceramic putty. And this is 18 months later. Actually, you can see dentin bridge formation right around the putty, around the uh, root repair material. So this is what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to accomplish... Um, or what we are trying to accomplish is to create this dentinal barrier right next to the material. We want this the uh, vitality to continue. If you had um, open apices, we want this apices to, to close. Um, let's look at this case um, before we finish our presentation slowly. Um, this was a partial pulpotomy as well. This is an interesting case because uh, it's a permanent tooth, very young patient, no history of pain, uh, no lingering to vital pulp therapy. We removed the uh, cavity and we had not complete exposure. We had small exposure sites. Uh, instead of going all the way down to the um, orifices, we wanted to just take out a layer of the uh, pulp tissue at the exposure site. It, it, the reason of doing that was, if you look at the pulp chamber, how immature and adult, uh, immature and large it is. So if we can maintain the, uh, the bulk of the pulp, and if this tooth continues calcifying and... Um, with much smaller pulp chamber, that would be the ideal healing for us. Um, the exposure happened, we placed uh, bioceramic material and we sealed well. And, um, and this is eight months follow up. A uh, couple things we need to pay attention to. Uh, look at the apical portion of these teeth, they are maturing. Eight months later, it's closing. Um, and also you see the dentin bridge formation right below the material. The pulp chamber is calcifying, which is a good sign that we maintain the vitality health of the pulp. So um, let's talk about the partial pulpotomy with the trauma cases. I think this is a good example uh, uh, with the bioceramic material. Uh, this was a trauma case. Patient came in, pulp exposure in the anterior, very pinpoint exposure. The other one was uh, uh, actually at this point, uh, polyp, pulp polyp, because patient showed up more than a week after the trauma. Um, 
So we decided to do partial pulpotomy. Patient had no pain, no lingering uh, pain to cold, um, not waking up in the middle of the night, no spontaneous pain, no provoked pain. Um, it's a young patient. So we decided to uh, maintain the, the pulp structure in the roots. We went in, we did the partial pulpotomy. With the burr, we went in a couple of millimeters establish hemostasis, um, uh, and this is considered healthy pulp. When you establish hemostasis, we put bioceramic putty, and we used Fuji glass ionomer cement, and we restore the teeth a couple weeks later. This is a three-month follow-up with a composite restoration of those teeth. Let's look at this: the development of this tooth, progress of this tooth. Um, uh, with x-rays. This was the pre-op. Uh, you can see the exposure, the um, uh, root, the crown fracture on the tooth, open apices, very large pulp, um, and the roots. And this is after, um, after the composite filling was placed, after the bioceramics were placed. Um, Dentinal bridge formation three months later is apparent radiographically. You can see that the root continues developing even three months later. This is 11-month follow-up. Very uh, large dentinal bridge formation. Um, this is the goal of our vital pulp therapy. You see the thickening of the dentin uh, roots and you see the closure uh, or development of the root ends after almost a year, uh, the treatment. Um, the, uh, this is another case where we use the uh, different, two different materials, biodentin and BC putty. Uh, this, this tooth here uh, was uh, treated with bioceramic putty. Uh, this is our post-operative. This is three months later. You see the dentinal bridge formation uh, right and after under the material. And this is nine months later. You see the continuation of the root development at the apical portion, indication of um, healthy pulse uh, uh, tissue within the roots. So what is the uh, success uh, rate of partial pulpotomies? Uh, historical partial pulpotomies. Unfortunately, we don't have good data with uh, bioceramic material, materials other than a uh, lot of case studies or case series uh, publications. This is Svek, uh, uh, from Svek uh, Pulpotomy. Uh, you know, that's his study. Uh, but he showed the 96% success rate when uh, the Svek pulpotomy is done by, with calcium hydroxide. Um, this is due to trauma. And when you have caries uh, exposure and when you do partial pulpotomy, the success uh, is shown on scientific, um, uh, with the scientific uh, articles, it was 93%. So this is a very nice success rate. Every, anything above 90%, we should be very, very happy. But it, when you have caries pulp exposures um, with, and if you try to do partial pulpotomy on teeth with, with pain, uh, history of pain, or if you see any radiographic changes um, and you have caries exposure, uh, the studies show that the success rate goes down to 66%. So if you do have caries exposure, um, and the teeth with, with pain, uh, radiographic changes, but the, the symptoms are right in between. You know, it's lingering a couple seconds, but not much lingering. So patient has some, some uh, pain, unprovoked pain. You see some changes radiographically, but you really want to do uh, try vital pulp therapy then I would go to full pulpotomy rather than partial pulpotomy. At this point, you really want to get to the healthy pulp uh, and seal if you don't want to do root canal treatment. But as I said, 
the sixty-six percent success rate is not acceptable. We are we can reach a higher ninety percent um, with our regular root canal treatment. If you want to try still vital pulp therapy on these cases, I would do full pulpotomy instead of partial pulpotomy. Um, Let's summarize what we have talked last uh, 45 minutes, 50 minutes maybe. Um, case selection is extremely important with uh, vital pulp therapy cases. Um, this could be uh, direct, uh, could be indirect, could be SVEG or partial pulpotomy or full pulpotomy cases. Um, you have to follow uh, your diagnostic tests. You have to... Um, apply cold uh, EPT if it's necessary on the teeth to I, um, uh, diagnose the healthy tooth structure if, or to uh, pop. If, you, uh, if this is in a reversible stage, you will get uh, best results. Um, we do uh, obviously pop uh, therapy on permanent teeth. Uh, this should, you know, you should have positive to pop testing without lingering, no history of spontaneous pain, no percussion sensitivity, and, and young patients, they respond much, much better than older patients. Um, major reasons for vital pop therapy failures. Uh, if you do have failure or if you want to uh, try vital pop therapy and if you say like, uh, when this case will, or why this case will fail in advanced inflammatory process. So as I mentioned at the beginning of my um, uh, presentation, histological studies, they show that the inflammatory process uh, doesn't advance to the deeper layers in the root very quickly. It goes advances layer by layer, and the pulp could be really inflamed and necrotic next to the uh, caries lesion, but a couple millimeters below it could be completely healthy. Clinically, we cannot dif differentiate where that cutoff point is. Um, histologically, we know exactly where that cut cutoff point is, but clinically, we don't know. The indicators of that is hemostasis. You know, we try to establish hemostasis. If we cannot establish hemostasis, we automatically assume the inflammatory process is a little bit deeper. Um, the only sign that uh, accepted and we go by clinically at this point is hemostasis. So if your case fails, um, most likely that the, the pulp tissue that you remove when you did pulpotomy or when you did um, direct pulp capping, the tissue facing that the caries lesion was inflamed and we should have gone a little bit deeper to remove the pulp tissue. Um, the other reason is failure of restoration. The older, prison, older uh, studies... Uh, the uh, papers, uh, they showed lower success rate because their restorative material failed or their calcium hydroxide they placed on top of the, uh, the pulp tissue did not seal well. Um, as soon as you had exposure, that calcium hydroxide washed out with saliva exposure or the fluid exposure. But the materials that we use today, bioceramic materials, if you use a millimeter, two millimeter thick, with time, this is going to seal much, much better. As a result, it's going to give a better environment for pulp tissue to develop that dentinal bridge. And the third reason could be aseptic technique. Uh, you have to... Uh, use antibacterial solutions. Um, uh, the solution of choice at this point is sodium hypochlorite. If you want to use 1% or 3% or 6%, it's your um, choice as long as you keep it um, uh, long enough 
and you wipe the whole chamber to disinfect the, the chamber. Uh, using rubber dam definitely is part of our aseptic technique um, and using sterile instruments, obviously, uh, when you remove the caries with a spoon excavator, wipe the spoon excavator after removing the, uh, the, the pieces. Um, needless to, you know, I don't have to say that, but even the burr, uh, when you remove the bulk uh, uh, caries lesion, if you know you're going to go into the pulpal tissues, maybe it's good to change the burr and use a sterile burr. Uh, when you are dealing with the soft tissue. Uh, what we need to do postoperatively uh, after the treatment, um, we need to follow up uh, on our patients. This could be a week, two week follow up. Usually we bring the patients back uh, to the clinic. So we do the, our diagnostic tests. If we decided to put um, a temporary filling on top of our bioceramic, uh, we bring the patient back two weeks later. At uh, that time, we can remove our temporary filling material and place a composite material uh, to seal better. So uh, you have to question your patient if the patient has any spontaneous pain, lingering pain, developing uh, pain without provoking um, hurting in the middle of the night or when they drink something cold or hot, it, it really lingers. Um, Recall test, you should do a thermal test. Uh, if you don't get good response with the heat, the cold, if you do full pulpotomy with all that material that you are sealing the, the pulp chamber, you may not get good transition of uh, cold uh, sensation into pulpal tissues. You may want to do EPT. EPT would not show you the inflammatory uh, if there's any inflammatory process going on, it will only show you if the tooth, the, the pulp is vital or not. Uh, we do percussion, we do palpation. We check the status of restoration. You know, not maybe immediately if patient comes back for six months or a year follow-up, you check the restorations. You always take x-rays, um, especially at three months, six months, and a year follow-ups because that's enough to show if there's any uh, dental barrier um, happening. Uh, it will show it's a good time uh, if everything is going south uh, for us to see the apical periodontitis developing um, on the x-ray. Um, you check your evidence of heart tissue repair. And then if it's a young tooth, you check the evidence of continuing root development. That concludes my uh, presentation. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to respond. Unfortunately, I did not turn my timer on. I don't know how long it took, <laughs> but <laughs> I hope I was within the limits of the uh, presentation. The gear is perfect, 100%. I think everybody would be quite happy to just carry on. <laughs> yes. I'm, just, should, I'm not sure. We carry on into the night for you, right? <laughs> exactly. Should I uh, turn my uh, screen off so we can see yeah, each other? Yeah, sure. 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 Okay, perfect. Yeah, you don't need to see my you know, background. So, <laughs> so Vicky, yeah. that is amazing. Yeah. The, the Thank case, you. The, the cases that you showed in the second half there are just, yeah. uh, I guess they speak for themselves and yeah. the how to and the why to is, is really very straightforward as your presentation presented. We do have a few questions that sure. I have got here. Let me just get these up. Um, th there is a lot of questions, but here's some that I sort of formatted for you. What age would you say the cutoff point for vital pulp therapy is? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, as I said, the younger is better for patients. Developing teeth, they respond really well. Um, however, um, pulp, I, I wouldn't do um, a partial pulpotomy or full pulpotomy on well-developed teeth, you know, uh, anything above 30, 35 years old. Uh, right. But I think it's a clinical judgment if, if it's asymptomatic tooth, a very small exposure, 
uh, while you're removing the carries, this is all mechanical. I would try it. It doesn't matter. Uh, right. At age 70, I would still try it. Right. Um, the important thing is follow-ups. You know, the, we have to follow up with our patients to make sure our treatment is working. Sure. There was one comment. Um, I don't like doing root canals. Can I substitute vital pulp therapy for root canal? Uh, I guess that comment, actually, there's more to it, isn't there? Because uh, It is. It is. Um, no, you cannot replace root canal treatment. <laughs> you know, if if uh, uh, the pulp is in you know, irreversible, irreversible stage, yeah. n- needs to be extirpated and root canal has I- to be done. I guess, you know, in, in New Zealand, definitely in Australia, we have been taught for, for I guess, millennia that if you expose a pulp in a Kerry's case, that, that's immediately a pulpectomy. Um, and I guess this sort of puts a different light on it because, you know, complicated molar endodontics can be challenging. And if, if there is a kind of state where that pulp can be saved, not only the pulp savings remains vital, but these challenging cases where sometimes, you know, some graduates, recent graduates are really expected to do uh, miracle working on some cases, uh, maybe in some of these cases where it sort of falls into the confines of the diagnostic um, bracket that you sort of mentioned and um, within the age group, it may be, you know, a sensible thing to go down that route. I guess. Uh, You're right. Uh, You're definitely right. Um, Important thing is the diagnosis um, and follow-up. These are all learning cases. Uh, And these are relatively new concept uh, for us, uh, as you said. You know, older generation uh, in 70s, 80s, this was popular. Uh, However, they did not have good materials like we have today. Um, right. uh, revascularization pro- procedure actually was done in 70s, 60s wow. and 70s, uh, but it didn't work because mm. they couldn't seal the tooth well uh, with sure. the materials available that time. Today, the revascularization uh, regeneration process procedure works really well because we have those new materials like bioceramics, right. root repair material. Um, uh, this is a learning curve. I think more we do, more we follow. I'm sure those practitioners will learn a lot from these procedures, right. and it's fun. It's it's good part of yeah, and the exactly. dynamics, good part of uh, what we do. Not everything is root canal. You know, take the tissue out, right. clean shape and fill. Um, as I said, it's uh, we need to protect the healthy pulp. Sure. So it's a good tool, good tool to have in your toolbox, right? Definitely. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Uh, another interesting question: Should I use caries detectors? Um, I don't use a caries detector. Um, actually, we use in the clinic with residents. Personally, I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason I don't use anymore. Um, Recently, I changed my uh, microscope, and it has a you know, uh, function yeah. that shows differently. I turn it on all the time. Yeah. Uh, care, we have to be careful with caries detector because um, caries detector may show differently, but it may not be really caries. Right. Uh, so you should use your clinical judgment. But I believe caries detector, because it changes the color, it changes your perception and you definitely uh, your eye identifies things that missed easily before that's the part i enjoy more than relying on oh okay color change this is what i need to remove mm-hmm. now the color changes and i say is this something that i need to remove and then i use my clinical judgment Got it. So everybody should have a microscope with a, a, a caries detector. Uh, I'm not selling it, so, but you know, um, yeah, it's sure. technology. With you know, I'm sure the loops will have those soon. Sure. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why not technology. using technology? Absolutely. Um, why does post-op uh, does post-op pain show my vital pulp therapy has not worked? 
Yes, if patients a patient develops spontaneous pain, I usually go by spontaneous pain more than cold, uh, because what happens is uh, a patient may lose vitality uh, without sensing it. Uh, that if top layer becomes really necrotic, it may not react to cold drinks and cold stimulus uh, and linger. But right. the spontaneous pain will start. So one patient comes, says, hey, I'm watching TV at night and suddenly I feel uh -huh. this teeth acting up. Then I would consider that unsuccessful um, treatment right. or, Excellent. or Excellent. approach. Excellent. Yeah. It's really, really valuable that. Um, it says, will the cavity shape size prevent sometimes doing, I guess that's to do with the restorative uh, yes. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that's part of uh, the consideration. If if the teeth is really broken down and you need a good crown restoration, uh, you need good buildup in it. That should be part of your decision making process. You know, it's right. it's yeah. a continuum. Uh, restoration part is big part of what we do as Absolutely. as endodontists. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then follow on for that. How long do I wait for the final? Uh, how, how, long, how long should I wait before placing the final restoration? Um, that's a very, very good question. Uh, there is no scientific data out there to show this is what you have to do. Uh, we okay. all have to have our clinical judgment. So our experience uh, in our clinic is as soon as we see the classific barrier, dentin bridge formation yes. apparent on the radiograph, this could be three months. This could be six months. We recommend uh, to put a crown restoration on Got it. it. Um, but um, sometimes we wait. I mean, those x-rays, you saw them. Two-year follow-up, we still had composite build-up restoration on it. Uh, those cases, uh, our restorative colleagues, they are not ready to put crowns, even though they right. should. Sure. Um, but that's what I would go uh, by. As soon as you have radiographic evidence of calcific uh, barrier and the tooth is Got still it. vital, yeah, asymptomatic, I would, I would go ahead. Fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's lovely. We'll take a couple more questions because <laughs> sure. they're coming through thick and fast. Um, do you use EPT in diagnosis? Um, it, it's it's in our toolbox. The not all the time. Um, right. Uh, trauma cases, definitely I use EPT. If I get a good, healthy response with cold, uh, I don't necessarily go for uh, EPT. Right. Yeah, sure. But if I need to confirm my cold test, then I would definitely go with EPT test. Got it. Um, there were a few more very interesting questions here. Hold on. Um, EPT, bioceramic. Can I use, can I, I think you covered this. Can I use the sealer rather than the putty? But you were placing some sealer and then the putty on top, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah. The um, difference between these materials, not much of a component of it, the particle size. Um, so that's why it doesn't matter. Actually, interesting. In, in the New Zealand NZDA uh, one issue back, they had an author presented some studies he did a few years back on the pulp vitality of complicated crown, crown fractures. Yes. They, rec they recorded in New Zealand um, because we have an accident compensation commission where all of this is recorded. So he went back and looked at the five-year post-stop vitality of these teeth. And it was really fascinating because in New Zealand, in that accident compensation group, it was quite a big group from memory, about 1,400 teeth in that group. Um, there was a, about a 50% pulp vitality post five years. Um, and he didn't really sort of make a lot of comments about that, obviously, mm -hmm. because it's hard to make comments on that sort of group. But it's an inter interesting statistic because one would imagine these group would mostly be calcium hydroxide, some kind of pulp capping rather sure, than the sure. sort of partial pulpotomy sure. uh, that you were sort of showing in those cases. That's, that's correct. And, um, and I think we need to think uh, 
practical and clinically. Um, so some of these trauma um, uh, fractures may happen in young teeth. And it could be very difficult, almost impossible to do root canals on these because open apices. So if five or 10 years later when the roots developed, but we lose the vitality, still it's a great thing to have. It's a a success because we need to think clinically. You know, at that point, what do I need? I need well-developed root structure so I can maintain my root canal filling material within the tooth. I know the you know compounds of that structure. So that still is a I see it, it as a success. Yeah, so that's an excellent strategy where you're planning long term to yes. create a, yeah. a successful outcome for the for the yeah. saving of that tooth over the patient's life. Yeah. Um, there, there are some other questions, and I'm sorry, but I guess, uh, Bakir, if there is anybody who wants to send you questions, uh, they can send them to me and I can uh, nudge you. And, and send you. Sure, that would be good. Also, I think I had my uh, uh, email on there. Um, yeah, if, sure. if, if anybody was able to catch it, the last slide. Uh, okay. But yeah, I'll be happy to. I'll be happy oh, well, to. Well, thank one. you. Yes. Like, it's got to be getting late there, back here, and you want to get home. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for staying after a long day. <laughs> thank you. I Yeah, yeah. thank you. It was fun. Um, it was great. Hopefully, I can make it personally there, and you know, it will be more relaxed environment rather than seeing 10 patients. Yeah. All I'd say is be careful because um, we, we have people from Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Costa Rica, Peru, Argentina, Ecuador, sure. Chile, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and now Bolivia as well. So you've got a lot okay, of... Okay, that's great. <laughs> yeah, Perfect. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, and thank thank you, you everybody for, for yeah, yeah, and join, joining in uh, whatever time zone you're listening and some people no doubt watching or recording. But um, yeah, Bakira, I really appreciate it and look forward maybe one day to meeting you again in person somewhere. I hope so. Thank you. Okay. Bon voyage for now. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.